All relationships, there's always a little agenda thing, not quite lining up between the two people, right? And so every relationship you're in in life is going to be a certain amount of tension. Just accept that. You ask any friend how their relationship is going, they're going to touch their face. The first thing they do. How's it going with Judy? Not bad. <laughs> yeah, we're doing okay. And the higher up on the face they go, the worse the relationship is. I heard you're having some problems. Not really. We just got to work on a couple things. I heard you might break up. Yeah, we got to break up. I can't go any higher on my head. All right. Well, good morning, Chase Oaks. Really, really glad you're here. Some of you are here for the first time in this crazy place, and uh, we're really glad you're here. And, uh, and I want to welcome uh, those at our Legacy Campus, but also everybody at Woodbridge, at our Sloan Creek Campus in Espanol, or everybody online right now, wherever you are. Uh, we are, are really, really glad to be here. And, and I want to say something before I jump into the series and uh, in our topic today um, of this talk. And that's just a kind of a way to go kind of thing. And, and I don't even know who you are, and it's probably a whole lot of you. But over the last weeks, I've heard uh, just from a number of people who are new in our church or who were in some situation where they really kind of needed some encouragement or welcome or something, um, where people have said, hey, I just want you to know this is like such a welcoming church or such a helpful church. And in examples where Chase Oakers either just reached out just with welcome or in some cases with prayer when they could tell that somebody needed a prayer with invitation, with relationship in a way where a bunch of people came realizing, hey, we're not just here to be blessed. We're here to be a blessing when we come. And I just think that's way cool. So thank you for being you. Uh, you're, you're awesome. So thank you. So uh, today, we are in this series called Wayfinder, and Wayfinder is about helping us navigate relationships, and we need that because relationships are tricky, and today we're going to talk about when relationships get really tricky. We're going to talk about hurt, and we're going to talk about conflict, and, and what, how the Bible can help us resolve that, because every relationship, doesn't matter how great the relationship is, every relationship will go through hurt, will go through conflict. Uh, a while back, I was reading an interview of Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife. I mean, Billy's in heaven now, but um, and the, it was, the interview was about their marriage primarily. And they he, she talked about some difficult times in their marriage and some hurt and conflict they had to work through. And the interviewer asked, um, well, have, did you ever think about divorcing Billy? And I loved her answer because she said, divorce never, but murder a few times, <laughs> which... Every relationship will experience that. Every relationship that's any, of, of any length will go through hurt, will go through conflict. It's just part of the deal. Um, I will say, though, that uh, this week, Christy and I, you know, a lot of times when I preach on a topic, I'm always nervous about it because I think Satan is going to kind of attack me in, in that area. And here I am talking about conflict and hurt in relationships. And so I'm always like, oh, man. But I will say, and this is a cool thing to say, that for this week, this whole week, Christy, my wife, and I had a conflict-free, hurt-free uh, week. Now, she's, that, it's awesome. Um, uh, she's been out of town all week um, in Puerto Rico with a friend. But still, you know, we've got that going for us. Uh, but in every relationship, it's going to happen. It's, but conflict isn't our enemy. Um, it's actually a friend to intimacy if we deal with it the right way. But it can go either way, and that's what this chart illustrates. It's kind of how relationships develop. Uh, most relationships start with kind of ignorant bliss. Uh, they, if they're going to progress, they tend to start really well. You meet somebody uh, dating, or you, meet, you go to a new church, and you're like, ah, oh, these people, this is amazing. Or you go into a new group, and everybody's like, yeah, this really clicks. It's so exciting, and all that. Uh, or the honeymoon phase in a marriage. It's, oh, this is wonderful. And that's natural. And then there comes disillusionment where you realize, oh gosh, these people are human. Like, you know, and you, and something, and you kind of, that starts cracking that a little bit. And then there's going to be conflict and hurt. And if in any relationship over time, there's going to be hurt, there's going to be misunderstanding, there's going to be conflict between uh, as long as sinful human beings are trying to relate to each other. But when that happens, that's really a turning point moment where it can go either way. And if it goes the wrong way, it goes this way. Now, to contempt. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time. It takes a while, generally, to get to contempt. But with conflict and hurt, if they're not dealt with, if they're not managed, or they're mismanaged, or they're poorly managed, or you make it worse in the way you respond, 
then what happens over time is conflict leads to hurt, and hurt leads to resentment, and resentment to bitterness, and after bitterness comes contempt, where your filter is now really broken towards that other person because of the hurt and the pain and bitterness and resentment. You can't even see positive anymore. You can't feel warmth anymore. It's just contempt. And that's a dangerous place for a relationship to get because it's a hard place. It's recoverable, but it's really tough because generally, once a relationship gets there, then you move to disconnection. Now, you don't have to be that way, right? And but it all started here. Because it can actually go another way if we learn to deal with conflict and hurt in a good way, in the way that we're gonna see in the Bible here in a few minutes. Because rightly resolved, conflict and hurt is a gateway to greater understanding, greater awareness of me, what's broken in me, greater awareness in you and of us and how we can relate and how we can move forward. And if we are able to do that, then it leads to the authentic intimacy that we really want. Last week, we talked about how to go deep in relationships, and we talked about, um, in, in that case, about communication and how to throw, if you remember, and catch, how to self-disclose in an authentic way and how to listen in a way that, uh, that fosters that kind of intimacy and how important that is to deepen our communication. Well, conflict is another gateway to depth. That, that when you and I go through hurt and conflict, it's not necessarily an obstacle, it's actually an opportunity if we deal with it the right way. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, look at the Bible and say, okay, God, you've given us wisdom, help us find our way, because on our own, we won't, go, we won't deal with it instinctively the right way. None of us will. As sinful human beings, uh, our instincts are just off on this. Uh, we, our, our natural instincts, if we just go with those, are not going to be toward here. We're going to end up not resolving it, not, not doing things very well. And, and to help us out before we go into this uh, passage in the Bible, I want us to be able to identify kind of our tendency in dealing with conflict, our natural tendency, and where we will go that will spiral, spiral us the wrong way. So I'm just going to, this is going to be a little simplistic, but I'm going to say all of us, there's just three categories of how we will naturally deal with conflict and hurt. And think of which one you're, would, would describe you the best. If you're married, would also describe your spouse the best. Or if you have kids, or if you have friends, or if you're in a group, and uh, just start thinking through that. So here's, here's the three. You're naturally either a stuffer when you're hurt, when you're angry, a sprayer, or a stealth bomber, all right? So let's go stuffer first. If you're a stuffer, when you get hurt and angry, you're, you just, you hate conflict and you hate bringing up negative stuff and it's just really hard for you to bring a conflict out in the open and you seem on the outside so sweet and wonderful and you are sweet and wonderful, but on the inside, if you're hurt and you're, you're not letting that out, then you're, there's a lot going on in there and a lot of, uh, it can lead to resentment and bitterness and all, and, and after a while, you'll either explode or implode. It's kind of like a pressure cooker. Um, when a, when I was growing up, I would spend a couple of weeks with my grandparents um, in Tennessee. Any people from Tennessee uh, in Nashville? And uh, it was always great to go there. And she would ask me every day I was there, uh, what do you want to eat? And it was, what do you want to eat today? And for me, it was always the same question. It was fried chicken because I loved her fried chicken. But I had to kind of, I also had to eat, she would always cook green beans when she made fried chicken, which means I, I hate green beans. I, that was like, kind of like my ticket. I'd have to eat green beans to get to the fried chicken. And, uh, and, but she would make green beans in a pressure cooker. If you know what that is, you know, it's on the stove, has a little thing on the top, and pressure builds up, and this little thing, this little metal thing on the top goes tick 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 and it's just really, and I remember being really little and seeing that thing and being so curious, and I went and I knocked the thing off the top to see what would happen. And of course, everything spews out. It's just like this big, crazy thing. And some of you are like that pressure cooker. And I mean, I've gone through a lot of counseling to try to get over that. I still hate pressure cookers and green beans uh, to this day with what happened. But, but some of you are like that, right? You're just waiting to explode. Or if you never explode, you can implode, meaning it's like acid in there where it's eating away uh, lots of good things in your soul and in that relationship. So if you're a stuffer, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous place to be. You don't look dangerous, but you are. A sprayer, and I can relate, by the way, I'm a stuffer. A sprayer, um, with a sprayer, you don't have to, nobody has to guess when you're hurt or angry. 
Like, it's obvious to everybody. It just comes out, just, you know, and that's the good news. It comes out. The bad news is typically how it comes out. It, it's often, you, you can do a lot of damage, uh, not being sensitive or, you know, that kind of thing. So sprayers do a lot of damage too. And then stealth bombers. A, a stealth bomber is a person that seems okay, but every once in a while, they just kind of drop a bomb. Go on. Uh, it's, what a, it's what in psychology we call passive aggressive. You, you deal with it and you deal with conflict or hurt in an indirect way. So like the stealth bomber, it just sort of comes out in weird ways. Like you're slowly along fine. And then if you're relating to a stealth bomber, they may some, say something just random like this. Or, well, if you actually ever did anything around here, you might know what it's like. You're like, what are you talking about? Like, where did that come from? Or, or sometimes it's just uh, biting humor or sarcasm. Or sometimes it's, it's uh, withholding affection or kind of dragging your, their feet. Uh, they, they act like they're on board, but they're uh, really not. There's all kinds of ways to be passive aggressive. And any of these will take you down the wrong side of that chart. And all of us, our natural tendency will be one of these. And so how can we do better? And God helps us out in the Bible. So we're going to be in a passage in the Bible, uh, in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. I always felt like, that this, I mean, there's a lot, there's actually a lot in the New Testament about how to get along with each other. It, it's really interesting to read through the letters of the New Testament and how much of it is about being unified and just getting along because as human beings, we're just not good at getting along. And so how do we get along? How do we work through hurt? How do we hurt, work through conflict? One of those big passages for me uh, is, that's been so helpful for me is Ephesians chapter four. So Ephesians is in the New Testament. Uh, we're gonna be in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, uh, he's going to help us out how to deal with hurt or conflict. So it might be helpful to, to get one in mind. If you don't have a hurt or conflict in mind, if you're here with somebody, uh, just turn to them and just say uh, the one thing that you don't like about them you've never said. Don't do that. I'm kidding. I'm just trying to stir things up. Don't do that. But uh, okay, here we go. He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. So the basic principle that we're going to start with here is to initiate the hard conversation. He says, speak truth. Don't hide it. Bring it out in the open and do it quickly. Uh, don't wait. Initiate the hard conversation. That if you've been hurt by somebody and you're angry, you're hurt, then it's, it's your responsibility to have the conversation in a timely and truthful way. That's if you're hurt. The Bible also says if you've been, I mean, if you've been hurt. The Bible also says if you're the one hurting, that if, if you realize, hey, I may have done something that offended somebody or they seem offended, then it is also on you to initiate. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 5. He says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, so here uh, it's like coming to church like you're at right now. Good job, you're here. And, uh, but in that day, he's talking about going to the temple, so the wording's a little bit different, but corporate worship. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift, your offering there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. What Jesus is saying is as good as it is to come and worship God and make this a priority and you're here and that's awesome, there's something even more urgent if you realize that there's an offense out there that's unresolved. And he's saying, so leave, like leave church and go deal with it, deal with it now. It's that important. And then come back. But I love the way he says it. He thinks like a preacher. He's like, go ahead and leave your offering <laughs> and then go. And uh, that's exactly what a pastor would say. You know, wait for the offering and then go, you know, deal with it. And um, because it's that urgent. And so let's look back at the passage again. How do we do this? He says, uh, in your anger, do not sin. Let's just dive into the passage a little bit. So when we have this, uh, to help us understand how to, hard, how to have this hard conversation. When he says, in your anger, do not sin. Um, so the original language of the New Testament is not English, it's Koine Greek. And so I'm going to make um, some observations. They've done some translation here, which is good, but I'm going to make some observations about that more than I normally do. And this is one of those. It says, in your anger, do not sin. But actually in the original language, it's a command. It says, be angry. Be angry and do not sin. It's two uh, commands. Be angry and do not sin. Meaning we're commanded to be angry. It's not bad to be angry. God gets angry, it's mean, meaning it's a godly thing to get angry. Anger is a good emotion. It's not a bad emotion. 
Anger motivates us to move beyond the status quo when there's a problem. It motivates us to do something. Now, the reason right away he says do not sin is because it's easy when you're angry to sin. It's easy to make a lot of mistakes, but it's okay to be angry. In fact, he says be angry. When you get hurt, it's okay to be angry. You should be angry. There's things we should be angry about. It should motivate us, but motivate us to move toward reconciliation, not to sin. So when he says be angry, do not sin, how can we sin when we're angry? Well, there's a lot of ways, but in the passage, he's mentioned two. One of them, he says, speak truthfully, put aside falsehood. So if you're a stuffer, I actually sin against you if I stuff. If I act like, put on falsehood, act like everything's okay when it's not. Or stealth bomber the same way. Or even as a sprayer, a lot of times what we spray is not the truth. It's exaggerations. It's, it's our motive judgments, things like that. But also, not only are we to uh, avoid sinning by not speaking the truth, he says avoid sinning by not letting the sun go down while we're still angry, meaning deal with it quickly. And there he quotes a, a proverb. It's a proverbial saying that was common in their culture. We uh, see this in other Greek literature of the day. Uh, this, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. He's like, don't, like, it's so urgent. Don't let the sun go down with an unresolved hurt. Deal with it before the sun goes down. Now, as a proverbial saying, it doesn't mean we have to take that overly literally. It doesn't mean that you, you know, you, yes, you absolutely have to do it before the sun goes down. I mean, and uh, because sometimes we, we really need time to process. Uh, sometimes we need time to pray through it and think through it, maybe even talk to somebody about it. Just say, hey, I just need to process my emotions. And online, if you go to our website, on the front page of the website, Lee Tran, who's our pastor of counseling, has another video that's extremely helpful to how to process our, our feelings and how to process our thoughts when we're in conflict or hurt. Um, so, so it doesn't mean you literally have to do it before the sun goes down, but it does mean do it quickly. Don't wait too long. Because if, we, if, you, if you avoid the conflict and you wait too long to deal with the hurt, here's what will happen. You will give the devil, talking about Satan, you will give Satan a foothold in your relationship. Now again, in the original language of the New Testament, this word foothold literally is just the word place. He's saying if you want to give Satan a place in your friendship, a place in your small group, a place at Chase Oaks Church. If you want to give him a place in your marriage, a place with your relationship with your kids or your parents, it's easy. All you have to do to give Satan a place to pull you apart, that's why it's translated foothold because that's the idea, a place where he can come in and pull you apart and he's always looking to do that. If you want to invite him into your relationship to pull you apart, it's easy. All you have to do is get hurt and don't resolve it and let it stay there. And you're like sending an engraved invitation to Satan to say, come destroy my relationship. And obviously we don't want that to happen, right? It's also interesting that when he says uh, the word he uses for devil, because there's, there's different words in the New Testament for Satan uh, to describe Satan. And one of them is this one. Uh, the actual word is diabolos, from which we get diabolical. But it means to be slanderous or to, to, to twist the truth. And I think Paul chose that on purpose because what he's saying is when you and I are angry and we're hurt and we allow that to go there, we're allowing the twister of truth to come in and, and, and he will begin to help to kind of cause us to start seeing the other person in a skewed way. It'll twist our perspective of that other person. And unresolved conflict does that. That's why you get to contempt where you can't even see the positives in the other person or the other group or church or whatever it is anymore. And so he says, man, don't, don't let that happen. Deal with it and deal with it quickly. Now, I said we don't have to be overly literal, but, um, but for Christy and me, we've, in our marriage, we've tried to, to make that more literal. So we, uh, we, and this is a little bit personal, what I'm sharing, maybe more personal than she'd be comfortable, but she's not in town and not here anyway, right? So we can deal with that hurt later. But... Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, but we, when we go to bed at the same time every night, which is actually difficult because she's a night person, I'm a morning person, so I'm ready to go to bed about 9.30 or 10. She's not even thinking about it till 2 or 3 in the morning, so we have to negotiate. But, um, but we, and we always, this is what gets personal, is we always go to bed in each other's arms. And, uh, and it, it, that's nice, like it, but also um, we, we do that because we found it's really hard if you have unresolved conflict and hurt to go to bed that way without like really squeezing each other, like, you know, you know, strangling each other. And, and so there's been a lot of times where we've had um, hard conversations late at night. 
but that's okay. That's good to work through it. The idea is just to deal with it soon, to initiate the hard conversation, whether you're hurt or you think maybe I've hurt somebody. Now, we're going to make it even more practical here to say, well, how do we set up that conversation in a way where it's most likely to achieve what we want it to achieve? And that is greater understanding and authentic intimacy. So when you have that hard conversation, first of all, communicate the offense head on. Now, if you're a sprayer, that's not a problem. You know, you're like, bah! it's already there, out there. But if you're a stuffer or a stealth bomber, then it's hard sometimes just to, to just throw it out there in a clear way. And that's what I'm talking about. And, and as a person, I grew up in, I don't know if I've mentioned this, I grew up in Alabama. Uh, have I ever talked about that? In Roll Tide, have I ever said that? I don't remember. I don't think I have. But, uh, um, but being raised in the Southeast, you're kind of taught uh, not to be a sprayer, but to be more of a stuffer or stealth bomber. And you, you deal with things more indirectly. And, um, and, and it's hard. Some, so, so people have told me that I could, make, I could tell somebody to go to the bad place in a way that makes them want to go there. Uh, they've told me that, that sometimes when I'm confronting somebody, they'll thank me. They'll be like, oh, that was so encouraging. Thank you. I was like, no, I wasn't trying to, I was trying to like get you. I wasn't trying to, you know, make you feel all happy. And, uh, and so I've had to learn how to be direct. And, and it's pretty simple, but for me, it's just really helpful that right away to say, hey, I love you, uh, this, but this conversation, is, it's a tough conversation because there's something I'm really angry about because I've been hurt, and maybe it's a misunderstanding. I don't know, but we need to talk about it. Well, then you're stuck, right? Then you got to talk about it. So communicate the offense head on. Focus on the facts, um, he says, speak truthfully to each other. Put aside falsehood. When we get angry, it's really hard to focus on the facts. And it's really easy to exaggerate. That's one way to, you know, and, and it's also easy to, you know, say you always, you never, those kind of statements. It's also easy to assign motives to people. And, and we do that naturally when somebody hurts us or something. We think, oh, they're just a jerk or they don't care about me or they just care about themselves or they're into the, or whatever it is. And we don't know people's motives. You and I, have, we should never make a motive judgment of anybody because we cannot know anybody else's motives. Those, those, that our motive judgments are not the truth. So what is the truth? Well, the truth is the fact of what happened and how it made me feel. I know that. Like, let's say I have a friend who is always late, and sure enough, they're an hour late or 30 minutes late or whatever again. And uh, after all this, and now I can make all kinds of motives judgments. They just care about themselves or so whatever, or, or that, but I don't know that. I just know the facts. They're late again. Even though we've had these conversations, they're late. I don't know how it makes me feel. It makes me feel frustrated. It makes me feel diminished or not valuable to them or something like that. That I can talk about. Those are facts. So here's the little formula. And this is just a super helpful little formula in a hurt conversation. When you do blank, I feel blank. When you do A, this is the way I feel. I feel B. And this is true. At least our, my version of the facts may be a misunderstanding, but when you do blank, I feel blank. So let me use another scenario just to make this concrete. Uh, let's say I'll use another marriage illustration because they're fun. Um, and it's fun to pick on married people. So uh, let's say you're married and you're the wife and you and your husband have had some conversations, a lot of conversations about getting your finances together and getting out of debt and, uh, and you overspend and we don't want to do that anymore. And so you made a decision and you've been really good at this, even though you've seen some really cool things that you wanted to go ahead and buy and just pull out the credit card, but you haven't done it. And, um, and that you've made an agreement that you will have a conversation if it's over a certain amount that you will talk to each other before you, you know, pull that trigger and spend money that you shouldn't spend. So you're doing really good. You come home this weekend with NFL kicking off and, uh, and you know, second week of college football, and your husband is so excited because he's just bought this new 120-inch 4K TV, and it's already on the wall, and it's already got this sound thing attached to it, and he's so excited, and he's like, honey, this is so awesome. This is, this is actually going to save us money. We don't even have to go to a cowboy game. It's better here, and it, all this kind of stuff. And, um, and what do you do, right? Because you're hurt, and you're angry, and you're upset, and you should be. But what do you know, right? So you say, hey, look, rather than just saying you're such a jerk, you're, you're insensitive, you don't care about anybody but yourself, I'll, you don't, uh-uh. But this is what you know. You say, hey, look, 
we agreed that we would have a conversation with each other before that. You chose not to do that. You chose to buy this TV without talking to me and break what we agreed to do. And when you did that, I need you to know how that makes me feel. I feel really devalued. I feel a little betrayed. I feel really frustrated because it's going to cause problems for us financially. And I'm just really hurt. And we need to talk about this and how to move forward and what to do, you know, because we, we just can't do this. Okay, that's a good conversation, right? And uh, because it's focused on the facts. Also, it's good, I think, because it's specific. And I think be as specific as possible. Just you always or you never or you do this or you do that. Instead of that, try to just be specific. That's a good specific illustration. I'll share one more just to make this even more concrete. Once again, I'll pick on marriage because it's fun. And I'll throw in an in-law. I'll throw in a mother-in-law because that's even more fun. So... Uh, let's say you, uh, you have a family gathering, and this is kind of a pattern that your mom, this, now you're the guy, your mom um, is uh, at the family gathering, once again, uh, says something demeaning in front of everybody about your wife, about her cooking, and about her parenting. And so that happens, right? And so you, what are you going to do? So you talk with your mom. You bring it out in the open. You deal with it head on and say, mom, there's a problem. There's something we need to talk about that I'm really bothered by and hurt by and we just, we need to talk about it. Okay, what is it? Well, you know, and again, be, be specific. Don't just talk generalities. Hey, you know what? Last week at our family gathering, twice, I don't know if you realize this, but twice you said something demeaning to Lori. And, uh, and people have been confused. My wife is not Lori. I just made up that name. I don't know why Lori. If your name is Lori, I, you're great. Um, <laughs> But uh, anyway, Lori, um, so, you know, you, you twice, like once you, you made fun of her cooking, it was a joke, but it, you know, kind of hurt. And then, um, and then you said something about her parenting, uh, about disciplining the kids or not disciplining the kids in a way that was really demeaning. And I, I need you to understand what happens when you do that. What happened? Like for Lori, like it was really hard. She was really hurt cause, and discouraged because she cares what you think. And it makes her feel like a really bad mom and a really bad wife and a really bad hostess. And the truth is, she's really great at all that and she works really hard at it. And then what it does to me makes me really angry. It maybe makes me hurt for her. And it makes me feel disconnected from you because you're attacking my wife. Like, you know, why would you do that? And it just, it, it causes a real rift between you and me. And then dad... It is, he feels awkward because he doesn't know what to do. He feels in the middle. And our kids, they feel really confused because they're wondering why is grandma being so mean to mom? And we have to talk about this. So can we? Like, what's going on there? And let's talk about how to move forward. Okay, that's specific. And as you have a conversation like that, be humble. Um, you may, it may be a misunderstanding. Once you talk about the facts and feelings, you may find out, oh, Okay, that happened. Now I kind of understand. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes you need to be open to the fact that maybe my feelings, maybe I'm just a little oversensitive. Uh, maybe I've inflated it too much. That's okay. Be open to it. But the point of all this is to initiate the hard conversation. Don't let it sit. Initiate the hard conversation. And when you do, not only the, the way you structure that conversation, the content of that conversation, but what Paul's going to focus on next is the tone of the conversation. It's kind of the how of the conversation, he's going to say, hey, when you have a hard conversation, make sure you fight fair. And we're going to start looking at the rest, uh, another passage in Ephesians 4, but, it, but picture like a referee at a boxing match, and you got, you know, bruiser over here, and whatever the name is over here, the Italian stallion over here, and the guy in the middle who says, okay, um, this is going to be a fair fight, no hitting below the belt, no this, no that, and that's what Paul's going to do. And so when you have that conversation, the overall idea is this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building, other, building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's what words are for. In every word, by the way. He says, when he says, don't let any unwholesome talk, he's saying none. Like every word, be a word that builds others up. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We grieve the Holy Spirit who is trying to build people up when you and I use words that tear people down. And even in a conflict situation, even when we've been hurt, even if you've done something really bad and I'm really hurt, it does not give me the right to use words that hurt you back. Because that's not what words are for. And it grieves God when we do that. Words, every word, is to build up the other person up according to their needs. Now, he's going to make that even more specific, and he's going to give us the, like, like fouls, uh, things not to do and things to do that are much more specific than that. He says in verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Those are all the fouls we're going to look at. Those are the not do's. And then the do's, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Right? So that's the fouls that in, uh, in the to-dos. Now, on the fouls, I think it's good to call fouls on ourselves. Sometimes we need to put some boundaries and fall count, call a foul on the other person if, if we violate one of these things. So you know what? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call time out right now. So what are those? One of them is bitterness. Um, if you hurt me, you may have sinned against me and you hurt me. But I sin against you if I don't deal with that hurt in a way that is timely enough that avoids bitterness. If I, if I allow myself to become bitter and resentful against you, that's my sin toward you. You may have done something that hurt me, but this is my sin toward you. If I allow, and if you and I bring that bitterness in to a conflict situation, into one of these conversations, even though we're talking about something specific, it's got all this bitterness and resentment, and that's not fair. And, and meaning we need to deal with that. We need to work through our bitterness and resentment. Um, another foul is rage and anger. Now, this is a little confusing, especially the anger part, because earlier in the passage, he said, be angry. It's a command, be angry. Here he says, put aside anger. Like, it's a foul. Don't, no, no no anger. So which is it? Like, is it anger or no anger? And again, the original language of the New Testament helps us out here, because both words are used, rage and anger, but grammatically, they're uh, linked together. So another way to translate it would be rage anger. Like, uh, there's a difference between being angry and having rage, having rage anger, where anger kind of takes over and you're like, ah, you know, that kind of thing, where you're no longer relating out of love, you're relating out of anger. You're, and, uh, and it's easy to do that. And when you and I find ourselves like all amped up with rage anger, we do things that are harmful, like Proverbs says with that kind of anger. Proverbs 14 uh, says, uh, angry people do stupid things. And we've all done stupid things when we've been angry. I mean, it makes so much sense. When you're rage anger, what makes sense is so stupid looking back, right? Like, why did I say that? Or why did I do that? At the time, though, it makes perfect sense. Why? Because it feels awesome to say that. That was a zinger. Ooh, I gotcha. Ooh, I hurt you. Ooh, you know, that was good. And then you're like, oh, that was stupid. So if we start doing rage anger, we need to call a timeout. We need to call a foul. And to say, you know what, right now I am uh, not controlling this very well. I need a timeout. I need to go pray a little bit, go on a walk, do something. And when we come back, or if the other person starts going there, I think it's okay to call a foul too. Brawling. A brawling is like, hey, let's throw down, right? Now that's what it looks like. And that would certainly be true. There's never, ever a reason ever for anger and hurt in one of these conversations to go physical. That, that's just absolutely true. But actually, the word itself used here isn't really talking about physical brawling. It's talking about verbal brawling. Uh, it's, it's translated uh, other places, uh, words like yelling, shouting, screaming. And that's a foul. And some of you grew up in homes where that was just the normal way. Like you grew up at home of sprayers, let's say. And there were a lot of yelling going on, a lot of shouting going on, a lot of screaming going on. And it's easy then to take that into our relationships as we get older but because you think, well, that's just normal or it feels normal, but it's, it's not healthy and it's a foul and you got you to gotta break the cycle. You got to say, I'm going to be the one to break the cycle. If this has been handed down to my family, we're stopping that here. And I'm going to learn how to express myself without doing that. And if the other person starts doing that, I think it's okay also to call a foul and say, you know what? We need to call time out a little bit. There's a boundary there. I'm not going to be yelled at. Uh, there's something you're communicating. It's important, but let's come back and when we can just talk. Slander is not telling the truth. Like we said, motive judgments, things like you always, you never. We've already talked about that. And then malice. Malice is just any way, that anything that hurts. It's the intent to hurt. That's what malice is. And it's easy when we're angry to hurt. I mean, if you kick me in the shin, what do I want to do? 
I want to kick you back in the shin, harder. And maybe not in the shin, maybe a little higher. I don't know. But I don't, right? I, you just want to get back at the other person. Paul saying, no, that's not the point. The point is not to hurt the other person. That goes against everything you're trying to do, which is greater understanding, authentic intimacy, that kind of reconciliation. So those are the not do's. And then the to do's. Again, that part of the passage, be kind, compassionate, forgiving. So let's break that down. It means my goal is to be kind in this conversation. I may be angry and you may have been, done something really bad to me, but it doesn't give me the right to be unkind. And even if you in the conversation get unkind, I'm not going to sink to your level. I'm going to be kind. It doesn't mean I'm not direct. It doesn't mean I'm not saying something that's hard to hear, but I can do that in a way that's kind and respectful. Compassionate, meaning I think about this situation, even in the conversation, not just from my perspective, but I'm trying to think about this from your side of it too. To, to be compassionate, to, to, to think about what it's like to be you. And even if somebody has done something really, really difficult, really, really hard, you can still be compassionate. It doesn't mean you allow it to happen, but, uh, but you can be compassionate toward it. There's an axiom, um, hurt people hurt people. And, and that's so true, that when people, uh, when people habitually hurt other people, those are people who've been deeply wounded themselves, have been deeply hurt themselves. And there's always, can always be compassionate, realizing, okay, this is a person I'm going to put a boundary. I'm not going to allow myself maybe to be hurt this way, but I can have compassion on them because hurt people hurt people. This is a person been deeply wounded. And then forgiving. The goal is mutual forgiveness. The goal is reconciliation. And, and what he says is, be just as gracious, be just as forgiving as God was when he forgave you. And how gracious is that? How forgiving is that? That's a pretty high standard, right? And he's saying there's a difference between trust and forgiveness. And, and if there's sometimes there's really big things that happen that cause you to have a hard time trusting. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is free. And that's a whole other sermon I don't have time for. And if you're wondering, how do I trust again? I, I would talk to a counselor or a therapist or something. Just say, yeah, when should I trust again? But here we're talking about just how to deal with conflicts and relationships that happen. And we keep short accounts. And we should have the intent to forgive when we've been hurt. In fact, that leads me to the last part of this. So we've talked about initiating the hard conversation, fighting fair, but also remembering the goal. Because the goal is increased understanding. The goal is intimacy. The goal is reconciliation, mutual forgiveness. Uh, the goal is not to hurt you back. The goal is not to win the argument. The goal is not the one that's the right one. I'm right and you're wrong. But it's hard when we, at least it is for me, when I'm really angry and we get in one of those discussions, let's say Christy and me, sometimes even when I know I'm wrong, I, it's hard for me to admit that because I want to win the argument. I want to feel right. Like at least I want her to think I'm right. And, and you have to say, oh, wait a minute, that's not the goal. The goal is not being right or wrong. The goal, or winning the argument. The goal, we're on the same team. The goal is authentic intimacy. The goal is reconciliation, mutual understanding. And so one of the things that I used to do when I did more uh, counseling stuff, I'm not very good at counseling and I don't, it's not my gifting and it's not my job. And so I don't do it very much, but I used to. Now I just finally figured out there's people who are actually really good at it <laughs> that I can say, yeah, you need to talk to them. But, um, but one of the things I would do with like when married, when two married people, especially, or sometimes they were singles and just at odds with each other and they were wanting me to help resolve it, is I would say, okay, physically, you know, we'd be around a table in my office, and I'd say, I want you guys to move to get on the same side of the table. And then I'd, on a piece of paper, I'd write out the hurt or conflict, and I'd put that on the other side of the table. And I'd say, I want, you to, I want us to understand that it's not you against you. It's both of you working through this hurt, working through this issue, to get what you both really want. And that is, a better relationship, an understanding. It's, it's both of you on the same team, on the same side of the table, working through this together to get to where you both want to go. It's not you against you. And, and that's exactly the point, right? Is to remember, hey, this is not about hurting you back or being right or showing you what a bozo you are. This is, uh, this is about mutual reconciliation and forgiveness. So let's think about, oh, I need to say that also means to do that. It means both of us asking the question, even if you think the other person's 100% bozo and you're 100% awesome, which is never the truth, there's always some of both, um, is to listen and say, where do I need to repent or where do I need to take responsibility 
and where do I need to forgive? And by taking responsibility in a conflict situation means getting to a point where you admit, you know what, I was wrong. I, I'm sorry. I hurt you, and I hate that I did. And I don't want to do that anymore. I, I, I want you to pray for me. I want you to hold me accountable. I, I, I want to take steps, whatever steps those are, to not do that anymore. Go to a counseling, go to God, do something, talk to, help, get other people to help me. That's not who I want to be. That's taking responsibility. And on the other side is, where do I need to forgive? Because where I've been hurt, my job is to forgive. And where I've done the hurting, my job is to take responsibility. And if both people are listening, where do I need to take responsibility and where do I need to forgive, the chances of that becoming effective to greater understanding and reconciliation are extremely high, right? So think about a conflict. Think about a hurt. And let me encourage you to initiate the hard conversation. That's not the easiest choice, but it's the best one. Initiate the hard conversation. Don't wait too long. You may have to process your feelings a little bit, but all that. Fight fair and remember the goal. And here's the cool thing. It's harder to do this, right? It's, it's hard to initiate the hard conversation in a, in a way we're talking about it. Not just spraying it, but really dealing with it, having the conversation. But you know how earlier we talked about that if we don't, and we sit on it, and we allow it to stay there, how we invite Satan, we give Satan a place in that relationship, and that's true. But when we do this, we push Satan out, and we invite Jesus in to our relationship in a really cool way. Jesus talked about that in a passage in Matthew 18. If you've been around Christianity for a while, if you've been around Christians or grew up in church, you probably heard this verse. If not, it'll be new to you. But Jesus said in Matthew 18, where two or three people are gathered together in my name, when that happens, I will be with you in your midst, meaning I'll be right in the middle of you. And people say, oh, that's so neat. When I go to small group tonight or when I go, then, you know, where we're, we're gathered, Jesus is there and that's what he's saying. And I think that is true, but that's not what Jesus is saying. The context of the passage in Matthew 18 is when you're confronting someone, when you're initiating a really difficult conversation, Jesus says, hey, you're not on your own. That's a scary thing to do. I will be with you. I'll be right there in the middle of it, helping you and helping them. I'll be right there. And if you want to push Satan out and invite Jesus in, if you want Jesus to get a place in your marriage, in your group, in your relationship, in your friendship that has a conflict, if you want to invite Jesus in, then initiate the hard conversation in a godly way and you're inviting him in. And all you can do is your part, right? The Bible says, for as, for as much it is, as it is within your power, be at peace with all men. You can only do your part. They may or may not respond well, but your job is to do your part, and Jesus is there with you to help give the best possibility for it to work well. So let's bow our heads together and invite Jesus into these conversations. And if God has brought something to mind, a conversation that you need to have, let me encourage you to process it and then have that conversation as, as we've talked about. And right now, just give God, just in your in prayers, talking to God in your own words, just, just talk to him and say, God, you know the hurt. You know what's there. And I can only do so much, but help me do my part. And invite Jesus in to that conversation. Father, I thank you that you want us to be unified. You want us to have peace and reconciliation. And you know as human beings, we're just not good at staying that way. And there's a lot of hurt in this room. There's a lot of hurt in all of our lives. And God, would you help us deal with that responsibly and just do our part the best we can. And in Jesus' name, amen.